Hello and welcome to Home Canning 101 presented by Utah State University Extension. I am Melanie Jukes. I work for USU Extension based in Salt Lake County and I'm here right now in Salt Lake City bringing this to you. I've been teaching canning classes for about 12 years with USU Extension and have been trained from food specialists around the country and state and I'm excited to be able to share with you one of my most requested classes on just the basics of canning, where to start and what you need to know which are great for both beginners who have never canned before and those who have been canning for many years. There's probably some tips in here that can improve your canning practices and habits. So let's start a little bit by talking about why do we preserve food in the first place? So there's lots of reasons why we preserve food. One of the main reasons I like to do is because I'm also a gardener. I love to grow my own food, but I can never eat as much as we grow before it spoils. So preserving food is a great way to avoid the spoilage and to make food last for longer. And I love to use it all year long, especially in the winter, um, bring back some of that fresh taste to our table. A lot of people enjoy it because of the flavor and quality. Sometimes home canned food just tastes a lot better than the canned products you can buy in the store. Also, others enjoy it for convenience. It's pretty easy to just grab something quickly out of your pantry or your cupboards and that you grew or that you put up for yourself and have that ready to eat quickly. There, is some, there are some things you can do to improve the nutritional content. For example, if I go to the store to buy canned peaches, I might only have a heavy syrup option where there's a lot of sugar, but I can can it in fruit juice, for example, and reduce that sugar content a little bit. So there are some things you can do to improve the nutrition content of the food. The sense of satisfaction that comes with putting up food and preserving food, whether that's dehydrating or canning or freezing, is also really great when you're able to see all that work that you've done. It can be a great hobby and tradition for people to do. There are some special diet needs that you can also control when you can your own food, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the slideshow. Um, and those tend to be most of the reasons why people preserve food, and there might be others for you as well. In this presentation today, we'll be talking about methods of preserving. We will be focusing on canning specifically, but we'll mention the other ones and give you resources on where to go to find information on those. We'll talk about food safety and how that relates to canning. We'll talk about where to find that re those reliable, scientifically tested recipes that will keep our food safe. We'll talk about the two canning methods there are and how the process works. We'll talk about adding acid to tomatoes, why we need to do it and how much. We'll talk about altitude adjustments for those that are not at sea level, what not to can that we know isn't safe or that puts us at risk. We'll talk about the customizing of recipes you can safely make. And our number one question always is around the storage of these food products and we'll discuss that as well. So let's jump into these methods of preserving. While we'll be talking about canning today, there's also freezing, which is one of the quickest ways to preserve the food you have. Um, freezing is more or less a lot less hands-on time. Dehydrating is a great method as well, but needs a little bit more equipment. There's also fermenting and salt curing. A lot of other methods to preserve food beyond canning. Even within canning, you can ferment, for example, pickles or sauerkraut and then can them once they get to the, to when they're ready. So there's a lot of different ways to preserve the food you have. And if canning isn't for you because of all the time and effort it takes, there are other methods too that you can still eat local, eat your own food and preserve that throughout the seasons. So let's talk a little bit about food safety and how that relates to canning. So if I had these hamburgers here for you on a platter but couldn't guarantee that they were cooked all the way, how many of you would eat them? There's probably quite a bit of hesitation in there. I don't know if I wanna eat uncooked meat, but why? Why are you hesitating on that? What is it that concerns you about eating raw meat? So maybe you know from experience that maybe once you ate some raw meat and got sick, that can be kind of hard to trace, especially because we eat a lot of other things in our diets. So how do we know? We hear it on the news, we hear it from friends, you know, I took a food handler's permit class and they told me, but how do they know? How do, how do we know that eating uncooked meat could potentially make us sick? Well, we know that from science right? Food science scientists, they've been able to even determine in labs exactly what it is on that burger that makes you sick when it's undercooked and how to prevent it. So unfortunately, there's about 48 million cases of foodborne illness each year. That equates to about one in six of us getting a foodborne illness every year. So you might want to rethink some of those tummy aches we sometimes get. Maybe we are having about a foodborne illness. 
128,000 hospitalizations each year in the United States from foodborne illness, and unfortunately about 3,000 deaths. So food safety is pretty big and it affects a lot of us and probably more than once in our lifetime it will affect us. Fortunately, we know from the science of this that there's a way to prevent it. So if we cook this meat to 160, 165 degrees, the E. coli bacteria, for example, is destroyed and it will not be on there as, as we eat it hot. Now, if we leave it out, it could be cross-contaminated. That's another story in another class. Science, food science in the same way affects canning as well. And we know from science how to safely prepare food so that it gets hot enough for long enough to kill any microorganism and destroy it so that it doesn't create a foodborne illness in our food stored in jars. So food put into canning jars is not immune to any of these microorganisms that are on regular food. And in fact, it's even unique in some ways. And we'll talk about that next. So canning is not cooking. It is definitely a, a scientific process we want to follow. Now you could argue that can cooking is also a scientific process, which is true. It's definitely chemical reactions involved, but we have a lot more leeway in our cooking recipes where you can add ingredients, take away ingredients, substitute ingredients, exchange ingredients, just based on preference, what you have on hand, maybe special dietary needs. And that's not as concerning because you're heating that up or you're mixing it up and eating it right away. You're not expecting that food to last a whole nother year or more. So that's how it differs quite a bit. There's also a unique microorganism that exists in, in a canning environment that doesn't exist elsewhere. And we'll talk about that next. So this is botulism. So improperly canned low acid foods can become contaminated by a germ. This germ can create botulism when it's in the right, or I guess you could say wrong environment. So this germ actually exists in soils around the world. It's called Clostr Clostridium botulinum. And if we came in contact with that as we're out working in the soils and it got into our digestive system, no big deal. But when it's in an airtight environment at room temperature and it doesn't have acid to protect it, that's when it germinates and then it creates a toxin botulism, which is a fatal illness. Now, unfortunately, botulism is fatal, but it is rare. It doesn't happen very often. However, the CDC does report there's at least one case affecting two or more people every year. The worst case was about three years ago in Lancaster, Ohio, 2015. There was a church potluck where um, someone had brought a dish of home canned, or a dish of potato salad made from home canned potatoes that were improperly canned. One person died, unfortunately, and 17 others were under hospitalization for botulism. Some symptoms of botulism include vomiting, diarrhea, which is similar to a lot of other foodborne illness, and also double vision, blurred vision, droopy eyelids, slurred speech, difficulty swallowing, thick feeling tongue, dry mouth, muscle weakness, which a lot of those sound like a sign of a stroke. So anytime you have those symptoms, you should probably always be going to the emergency room. The CDC would recommend that too. If you happen to be um, aware that you consume home canned foods, it'd be nice to let the medical providers know there is an antitoxin and they can help with it if they can catch it soon enough. It's a, um, an illness that affects the nervous system and can cause paralysis. So the quicker they can treat it, the better. But again, fortunately, we know through science that there's a way to prevent it, to make sure that that Clostridium botulinum is destroyed so that it can't ever be in the jar to create botulism. And we'll teach you how to do that to make sure you do it throughout your canning. Now, botulism actually doesn't have a smell or a taste and you can't see it. So it's hard to say, you know, if your can looks a certain way, it has botulism because you don't know. But there are other forms of spoilage that can take place inside either store-bought or home can jars. So if you happen to have a container that's leaking, bulging, or swollen, throw it out. If it looks damaged, cracked, or abnormal, toss that too. If it spurts liquid or foam when you open it, get rid of that. And of course, if the food is moldy, discolored, or smells bad, you'll want to get rid of that too. So if you're ever in doubt about the safety or quality of that food, probably better safe than sorry to get rid of. So let's talk about where we go for this safe canning information that's scientifically tested. So hopefully, we're all aware that you can't just believe everything you see and read. And if you do a simple Google search, you may or may not be coming across a recipe that is scientifically tested. So where do we go first? The best place, one of the best places to go first is the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning. I sometimes call this the canning bible. It's all about the basics of canning, has a ton of recipes, and right within those recipes, 
has the processing times for every altitude that you might need to adjust with. So you don't have to do any math to figure that out. This is available as a free ebook. The website will be in the notes that will be included with this webinar um, through the next website, which I'll show you, but it's free to download. You can probably also buy it from a lot of the extension offices around the country if you wanted a hard copy of it. It was revised in 2015, so fairly new. Um, new things have been added even just within the last couple of years. The next place is a National Center for Home Food Preservation. Now they kind of are the USDA's laboratory and it's housed by the University of Georgia. So although they're three different things, they're kind of one and the same as well. This website is great. So it's homefoodpreservation.com. And you can see a picture of the screen there. I will often go here when I get calls that I, I don't know off the top of my head. But here is this awesome section that just says, how do I can, freeze, dry. And you can click on that and then it will open up all the other menus that they have underneath that. It has a great search function. So if you're looking for something specific, you can find it there as well. This is also the website where that USDA guide is housed. The next one is Utah State University. Um, we've got a great canning website that will continue to be improved. And we've gathered up all the fact sheets from our faculty over the years. There's great information on, on preserving specific food beyond just canning as well. We'll have freezing and dehydrating information there. A lot of other extension resources throughout the country should be safe to use as well, as they are also required to follow USDA's canning guides. So Easy to Preserve. This is put out by the University of Georgia, a great book that does include freezing and dehydrating where the canning guide is just canning. So this includes, it's totally compre comprehensive and preserving. It's got great information when you've got questions um, that are pretty specific. It can almost always be found in this guide. They have great charts on altitude adjustments and their freezing and dehydrating timetables and how long things take to dry and how long you need to blanch things before freezing are also very user friendly. This is available only on their website Amazon sometimes has them, but they're kind of sold by other users, and so they're more expensive. So the best way to go is through the University of Georgia's website to buy these. And they also have a DVD that if you've never, ever done canning, might be really helpful to watch. Um, the next is the Ball Canning Company. They've got a great assortment of books. So this one on the left, it says at the top, the Ball Blue Book. For many, many years, they actually had a book that was blue with um, some sort of canned good on the front. And... Over, I mean, for decades, I feel like it was blue. So their new blue book isn't really blue, but that is their latest one. It's about eight to $10, depending on where you buy it. it. Has lots of different recipes in it. You do need to adjust for altitude. So they'll tell you on, I think, page nine, how much time you need to add, depending on where you live. They also have this complete book of home preserving, which has like 400 recipes, and they're not all the same. So there might be new recipes in that book versus the ball book and vice versa. They also have this other book, the all new ball book of canning and preserving, which is definitely more aesthetically pleasing. They've got like a picture per recipe, um, more recipe book style versus some of their older canning book full of recipes. They also have a few like magazine that you might see at the magazine section of your grocery stores or stores. And they do have a few other books too, and all of them are great. Their website also is great, freshpreserving.com. And everything on their website isn't always in the books and vice versa which is good and bad, I guess. It keeps you going back and forth, back and forth, but they've got a pretty user-friendly website. They have an awesome pectin calculator that you can use to calculate which, how much you need for how much fruit and different ways you can make it versus li liquid pectin or powdered pectin or reduced sugar pectin, et cetera. Um, of course, they've got a lot of tools to help us with canning as well. And one of the last places you can go for safe canning information are the recipes and instructions included on things like the commercial pectin packages the pickling and salsa mix packages, et cetera. You probably will need to adjust for altitude as they won't have those on there. So you'll have to refer again to the USDA guide, the So Easy to Preserve guide or the ball books or website to find that or contact us here at the, your local extension office. And in a nutshell, that's kind of all. Those are kind of the only places you can go for guaranteed safe scientifically tested recipes. If you're doing a Google search or you're on somebody's blog or on Pinterest, you'll just wanna make sure you know where they got their recipe and see if they're citing those, those sources. All right, next we're gonna talk about methods and equipment for canning, a little bit about how to do it and what you're gonna need. 
So the downside of canning compared to some other methods of preserving is that you do need quite a bit of equipment and it varies depending on how much canning you're going to do. So you definitely will need jars. You want to make sure you're using tempered jars meant for canning such as the mason jars, the ball jars, or the cur jars. Probably want to avoid the like old mason jars that used to, or mayonnaise jars, pardon me, mayonnaise jars. As they're not tempered for canning, they can crack more easily and break. So definitely don't want to be wasting your time. I did that once. I had a whole batch of apricots I was processing and a jar I pulled out totally the bottom broke and out went all the apricots on everything. So make sure you're double inspecting, especially if you're getting a new batch of jars from a garage sale or a secondhand store or something like that. You'll need lids and the ones that are recommended by the USDA and the ball canning company are the one, the two piece lids where you've got a lid and a screw band. They, there are products made out there that are one piece lids and screw bands. Um, the studies that have been done on them have higher uh, seal fail rates on those than they will on these metal lids. So it's still recommended to use these metal lids. They do kind of expire. So if I went and bought some today and maybe I didn't use them all for my batch, if I kept them in my canning supplies and pulled them out next year, higher chance of them not working next year. They might, but it's recommended to use those in, like when you buy them within a year. And then you'll need the rings or the screw bands, which will help hold the lid in place, but you want it to jiggle a little bit so that the air can escape and create a vacuum seal. So those are what you'll need to actually put food inside a jar and make them seal and be shelf stable. You'll also probably need some tools. You're gonna to need to get those jars out of the hot boiling water. So jar lifter is very nice. A bubble wand or even like a, a small silicone spatula will help get the air out of the jars so that you can get the right head space, which happens to be like how much liquid you're gonna put at the top of the jar, which will help with a good seal. Um, so you can reduce those air bubbles to begin with and your food won't drop so low during processing. You'll probably also want a funnel just to, it's not I guess required, but it will minimize your, the mess you make and the, the spillage as you're pouring it in. And then of course you're gonna need something to put it in based on what you're processing and we'll talk about those next, like a boiling water canner or pressure canner. So before we jump into boiling water canning and pressure canning, we're gonna to need to understand a little bit about food acidity. So let's think back to like food science classes, maybe some biology classes, talk about pH and acid. So the higher the pH number, the, the less acidic something is, and the lower the pH number, the more acid. So if you look at this chart here, up at the top by like 3.0, we can see there's a little lemon, and down at the bottom by seven, there's a little um, cup of milk. And this kind of just shows the range of food that we eat and some is very acidic and some is not, some are not. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Clostridium botulinum germ can germinate into the toxin botulism in low acid foods. Higher acid foods in that range from three to 4.6 um, kind of just ward off that germ. It can't thrive with the acid, which is great. Um, we just need to know how to take care of that. So the acid foods, they only need the temperature of boiling water to kill any other microorganisms that could be present that could destroy our food or make it mold or go spoiled. Low acid foods need a much higher temperature and that can only be achieved through the pressure canner. So we're first gonna talk about boiling water canning and what that entails. So boiling water canning is where you take high acid foods and food products. So this includes fruits, jams and jellies, juices, tomatoes, um, salsas, Pickles and pickled products, because even though they might be vegetables that are low acid, the vinegar turns them into an acidic food product. And we are gonna put them in jars and completely submerge them in boiling water canning. I'm not sure why, but I hear a lot of people refer to boiling water bath canning as cold pack canning, but there's really nothing cold about it because these jars are going in warm and they will be boiled for quite a bit of time to make sure all those microorganisms are killed off. So here's a diagram of how that works. This one happens to use a rack that's like a basket for quart jars, which works great. If you have any smaller jars, they can kind of fall through the cracks and tip over a little bit, wiggle around in that canner. So maybe just a regular rack that is in a basket would be best to put inside if you're doing something like pint jars. But you can see in the diagram in the back, the jars are placed inside the, the simmering water, and then you cover it all the way until the water is one to two inches above the jars, and then you bring it to a boil and it will boil for however long those approved recipes tell you to. 
some jams and jellies are 10, 15 minutes, and some of the quarts are um, 45 minutes or even longer if they're certain types of tomatoes. So um, with this, what you do, again, you submerge them in water, bring it to boil, then you start your processing time. Once your processing time is done, you'll turn the heat off and remove your jar, or you actually turn your heat off and wait five more minutes. That's kind of a newer recommendation. And then you can remove them from your jars and let them cool on a cupboard or shelf somewhere. There's a couple other ways to do boiling water canning that doesn't include just a big stock pot like this one you see in this picture, the black metallic one. There's also this basket that the ball canning company makes. It's a silicone green basket that works as a rack and the jar lifter. It's really great for small batches and it can just be placed inside your own stock pot where it would fit in. Another one is this electric water bath canner. It also has some cooking capacity in it as well, but it plugs into your wall. It has that spigot to drain the water. It has this great, once you turn it to the canning setting, it maintains a perfect boil that you don't have to worry about it getting overboiled or stopping boiling. Um, I love that it takes some heat out of my kitchen and that it frees up my stove a little bit. So that's another great option. Again, it's just submerging it in water and you'll want a rack at the bottom of some kind. And that's what the boiling water process is all about for high acid foods. Now let's talk a little bit about pressure canning. So pressure canning has the ability to get much hotter than boiling water canning because it's using steam to fill up the pressure canner. So here's a little diagram of that. You can see at the very bottom by the jar rack, there's only about two to three inches of water. And then you place your jars inside and then you'll put your, your pressure cooker lid on and seal it and turn up your heat. And then the air will push out into this nice funnel of steam at the top that you'll want to vent for 10 whole minutes. And you're getting some of that air out so that the whole pressure cooker canner, the whole pressure canner can be filled with steam. And that's really important because that steam is what will get to 240 degrees, which is what's needed to kill that Clostridium botulinum germ. So once you've got the steam vented for 10 minutes, then you can cover up your vent there's lots of different pressure canners, so they don't all look like this one, but they all have a method of covering up the vent. Then you start to build pressure, and once it's at pressure is when you start your processing time. So pressure canning can take a long time beyond just the, the you know, 75 minutes or 50 minutes that the processing product might actually need. So make sure you're allowing plenty of time to do so. Um, I skimmed through that really quickly, but we have a great guide called Principles of Pressure Canning available through the USU Extension website that would walk you through it step by step. And even if you've pressure canned before, I'd recommend just reading over that to make sure you're not forgetting any steps. Once the pr uh, processing time is done, you can turn off your heat. The pressure would drop back down to zero. Once it's reached zero, then you can take the vent cover off and allow all the steam to come out. Once that stops, then you can open your canner. Again, wait five minutes before removing those jars. That would prevent siphoning, which can happen when it's super hot inside that pressure canner. I mean, those temperatures are still in the 200s. And if you're taking something from 200 degrees to your 70-ish degree house, that could cause a lot of liquid to siphon out, which yes, you'd lose some liquid in your jar, but it could also make your lids not seal. So make sure you, you give that five minute time for it to kind of settle before taking it out. Now, some of you might be familiar with these atmospheric steam canners. I know I grew up with them. That's what my parents used, my grandmother used. I've seen them quite a bit for quite a while. And, and still, actually, if you look inside the USDA books and the ball books, they would say you boil water canner, hot, high acid foods, and you pressure can low acid. But these are still available out in the marketplace. So in late 2015, I believe, University of Wisconsin actually did some really good research on these atmospheric steam canners to find out are they safe and how to make them safe? And they've got a great fact sheet on how to use them. If you've never used them before, I probably wouldn't recommend go, going to buy one because you can use your boiling water canner for a lot more things than you can use these for. The benefit of the atmospheric steam canner is something like gallon jars you might use for juices like grape juice or apple juice, where the gallon jars aren't really gonna fit in a boiling water canner. Um, but the atmospheric steam canners have only been approved for use on high acid foods and no longer than 45 minutes. Otherwise the water and the steam run out and you're just cooking those glass jars on your stove top instead of actually like steaming and processing them. So if you want to use these and are aware of them, then you'll definitely want to look up that atmospheric steam canning guide 
through the University of Wisconsin, and it's also on that homefoodpreservation.com website. Okay, let's talk about adding acid to tomatoes. So over the last few decades, tomatoes are just less acidic than they used to be. And um, people have kind of hybrid them to taste better for us that way. And even heirloom ones are less acidic than they used to be. And in many testing from many faculty around the country, they found that to be true. And already those tomatoes hover at that 4.6 pH, which we want it to be a lower pH and a higher acid so that we can boil water can them safely. So we have to add acid. And we need to do two tablespoons of lemon juice per quart jar. And that would just go directly into your empty clean quart jars before you put the tomatoes in or one tablespoon of bottled lemon juice for the pint jars. And you do wanna make sure it's bottled concentrated lemon juice not freshly squozen and not the little fresh juice you buy in the produce section. You can also use citric acid, which would be about half a teaspoon per quart jar and a quarter teaspoon pint. Those are your best options. It is safe to use vinegar, but you have to use a lot more of it, about four to five tablespoons, and you're gonna taste that more in your tomatoes. So lemon juice and citric acid will give you the best product. Altitude adjustments. Now here in Salt Lake City, we are about 4,300 feet above sea level. And the temperature of water at sea level is about 212 degrees, but here in Salt Lake, our water boils about 205 degrees. So we need to add time to our boiling water process to accommodate that. For pressure canning, we have to add pressure because that pressure will increase the temperature of the steam. So those adjustments need to be made. In the notes of this, we will include a fact sheet for altitude adjustments from 3,000 to 10,000 feet. That information is also easily found in the USDA guide and in different places throughout the So Easy to Preserve book based on the section. So make sure if you do not leave at sea level that you're adjusting those recipes because all the other resources, the ball books, So Easy to Preserve books, are going to assume you're at sea level. And if you follow that, then you are under processing them. So make those adjustments. Okay, in this last section, we're gonna talk about what not to can and some of the adjustments you can make. So not everything can be canned. Everything you see in the store doesn't mean you can safely do it in your home. We're gonna start first with some favorite, family favorite canning recipes. So even if you have a family favorite recipe that's been going around for generations and nobody's gotten sick, it still could be unsafe if it, didn't, if it wasn't originally scientifically tested. So I get questions sometimes, they're like, oh, but this is the best salsa recipe ever. Can you test it somehow? And I don't actually myself do a lot of testing, but I have been able to look through books and resources. And there's been a few times that those family favorite recipes have actually shown up in the ball book, for example. So grandma actually got them from ball and passed them down to her family that way. And they're still in the ball book and still safe and approved. Sometimes that's not the case and I can't find a recipe even close to it. Or the ones I find that are close to it have a lot more acid to them than what they're doing. And in that case, I would recommend eat it fresh, keep it in your fridge, maybe freeze it, but don't, don't can it because without that scientific testing, we just don't know. Um, there's other kind of unsafe recipes that have been circling around families, neighborhoods, and the internet that aren't safe that we'll talk about in detail. So butter is one of them. A method for canning butter came out where really you were just melting butter, putting it in a jar and boiling water canning it. We know that wouldn't be safe because butter is low acid and they were processing it in a boiling water canner. But even if we'd process in a pressure canner, there's no testing to show how long it would take to actually kill any microorganisms that could be on there. So at this point, our recommendation is just to keep it frozen. It freezes great and nicely, and um, there's not necessarily a need to can butter. Hydrated wheat kernels is sometimes a question we'll get. So hyd or wheat kernels, of course, are great. You can grind into wheat, but you can also cook them and they'll be more like a barley. Some people want to be able to can them for convenience so that they don't have to spend the hours cooking it to use like they would a barley into soup or salads. So again, I would recommend if you want to cook a huge batch, then put them in smaller batch containers in your freezer. But at this point, it's a low acid food. As you cook it, it gets starchier and denser. So that affects the heat penetration. And it's just never really been tested as far as we know to give you the accurate details. The next one is quick breads. So I think this started because people used to cook them or there are recipes that you can cook them. Like you can cook your banana bread in a coffee can and it turns out in this cute round loaf that will make these awesome round loaf slices. Um, and somehow that morphed into canning jars, 
with lids on your shelf for a year. But these definitely get thicker as they process, which can affect the heat penetration. They're definitely low acid. There aren't any safe approved recipes for quick breads. Our recommendation would be to cook them and then freeze them if you wanted to save them for later. Dry beans is another one. So it is not safe to can dry beans dry. If you want to actually create a canned product of beans for your own storage, you do need to soak the beans and partially cook them following the USDA or so easy to preserve guidelines. So there won't be dry beans going into your jar with water. You'll have those partially cooked ones with water going in. They do need to be pressure canned. They take quite a while. Um, it can be a convenience factor. Dry beans also store great, just dry as well. So keep that in mind. So let's talk a little bit about customizing recipes and some ingredients you can adjust. So although we might think that salt is a great preservative for keeping food safe, in most canning recipes, it is just a seasoning and just for flavor. The only exception is for pickles. If you are fermenting your own pickles, it is needed for that crispness crispness and the actual pickling process. But otherwise, in things like meat, tomatoes, vegetables, you can add it or you can leave it out or reduce it. Sugar in canned fruit is another one that you can adjust. So canned fruit can be canned in a heavy sugar syrup or a very light syrup. It could even be canned in a fruit juice like, like pineapple juice or apple juice, as long as it's 100% apple juice or pineapple juice. Or you can even can fruit in water. However, sugar does help with kind of the plumpness of the fruit, the volume, and of course the sweetness. So if you do can in water, expect some pretty watery food product to come out on the other end. You can also um, add extra vinegar or lemon juice or any other type of acid. So I have a friend that is always adding citric acid to her peaches, not for safety reasons, but because she likes that it helps to keep the color. And that's fine too. You could always add it for extra color or zest. Not extra color, but to keep the original color. Um, you can decrease vegetables in salsas. Now tomatoes are technically a fruit and they're the most acidic part of a salsa, but things like onions and peppers, you could decrease. So if you happen to be making some from your garden and when you go up, go to pick some, you don't have as many bell peppers as you thought, you could still process that salsa with less sauce, with less peppers. The best thing to do in, with salsas if you want to adjust the heat is to either add in the seeds of your peppers or to exchange your peppers. So if it calls for bell peppers but you like extra spicy, don't add bell peppers and then more extra spicy peppers, but just exchange them so you're keeping the same amount within the recipes. So those are some ideas on things you can customize. If you've got other questions, contact your local extension office or consult the books that I referred to earlier to help you answer your questions on what you can adjust safely or not. Other things that you're not sure of, um, you can always add to the product when you go to eat it. So cilantro, for example, does not can well. Um, it gets grainy and dissolves and it gets a bitter test in your, taste in your salsa. So if you really like cilantro in your salsa, that's what you could add to it when you actually open your can and go to eat it. So that's an idea as well for other things you want to customize you can do at the time of eating. All right, now our number one most frequently asked question about canned, canned food is storage of them. So if I gave you all copies of the USDA book and the ball books and asked you, okay, what do they say about the storage? They're all going to say one year. And then we kind of laugh because probably a lot of us have eaten a canned food that's been older than a year old and we've been okay. So what's the story there? And if you look at it, it does say for quality. So over time, you'll lose color, you'll lose nutrients, you'll lose maybe some textural changes and maybe some taste will fade. But if the canned food has been properly canned according to these scientifically, the guideline, scientifically tested guidelines and hasn't been compromised in any way, the seal has stayed on, then that food is safe pretty much indefinitely. Again, over time, the quality of it diminishes. So it's best used within a year. So do yourself a favor, label and date what you put away so that you know how old it is. Use those older items first and then rotate and make sure you're keeping, you know, within a year for that best taste because you're going to eat it more and be more inclined to eat it if it tastes better anyway. Um, definitely want to store them in about um, 50 to 70 degree temperatures. Avoid really high things like 95 or above. So watch your garages if you happen to be storing in the garage during summertime or wintertime. The best place is kind of a dark, cold place, like a cupboard or pantry. 
um, maybe a, a food storage cellar, um, probably not under the sink where it can be kind of humid and warm under there as well. All right, in summary, I just want to talk about some of the best practices to make sure that you keep your food safe and, and protect those who are consuming it as well. Make sure you're following scientifically tested recipes that have been tested to make sure that they're removing oxygen and that the heat is um, penetrating and heating enough for long enough to kill all those microorganisms that could spoil the food or make us sick. Use fresh food at its peak of harvest. The quality of the product going in is the quality of the product going out. So make sure you're using the best that you can for that. Use clean jars that are meant for canning as we chatted about earlier and double check for nicks, cracks and breakages so that you don't have to waste that whole jar of food if it ends up breaking during processing time. Prepare one batch at a time for best outcome. So if you just have one canner, just prepare those one canner load at a time because the jar needs to be hot when it goes into the canner. Um, and it works best that way for jams and jellies too. The pectin will set up better if you're just doing one batch at a time. Um, make sure you remember that five minute waiting time after the process is, has stopped so that you know, um, well, it can increase the chance of the lid sealing better. Allow 12 to 24 hours for a lid to seal without bothering it. Don't push it down to see if it's done until after that time or else you could create a seal that's not a vacuum seal. We really want air bubbles to escape and the lid will come down in a vacuum seal. And if we touch that lid before that time, we could make that not happen. One thing that many people aren't aware of is that the USDA recommends that we remove those ring bands. So after that 12 to 24 hour period and it's sealed, take the ring band off, wash that jar, get the hard water off, the food particles off, um, give it a nice, good, soapy, hot water rinse, label and date it, but then store it without the ring band. That way, if it ever does come unsealed, you'll know because the, the screw band isn't holding down the lid and just store them that way without the ring band. So remember, there are other wonderful and delicious ways to preserve food beyond canning. This is just kind of an introduction to canning. Um, I'd encourage you to attend a class if you need to get more hands-on experience to understand. However, the USDA guides and the So Easy to Preserve books and the Ball books also have great information on how to, if you're still a little unsure on how to operate your equipment. I, am, I appreciate you joining us today, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Extension office. We will also be sending you a link for a survey. We'd love to get more feedback on this course, and maybe that will help us with other webinar courses in the future. Thank you.